So yesterday, we learned how to manually sign up and log in users. This was a good learning experience, but it took a lot of effort and it probably wasn't perfectly secure. So today, we're gonna to be learning about some of the tools that Django provides that will help us to conveniently and securely manage our users. So uh, first I'm gonna to have to do my normal Django setup. So I think I'm actually not gonna create a new virtual environment. I'm just gonna use the same one I had yesterday because it's gonna use the same dependencies pretty much. So let's activate that with oops, source totally slash vens auth env bin activate. Cool. So I'm reusing yesterday's virtual environment. Uh, this one already has Django and um, PsychoPG installed. So I'm not going to need to install my dependencies. Just going to use this to scaffold a project right here. And we're going to call this, what are we building today? Uh, it's going to be another blog. Not super exciting, I'm sorry. Blog project. All right, so CV into there. Create a blog app. All right, so first thing before I forget is I'm gonna add my app to the installed apps, blog app. And then we're gonna configure our database going to be using Postgres instead of SQLite. And the database name is going to be uh, actually, let me see what databases I have currently. Uh, all right, so this is just going to be blog DB, I think, uh, which does not exist yet. So I'm going to have to create it. Cool. So now I've got this empty database, blog DB. So it should be set up correctly now. We should be able to connect to it. I'm going to open a new terminal tab here, so I'll have to reactivate my virtual environment. Now we're going to make migrations. In the wrong folder, yeah. Uh, but of course, I have not made any models of my own, so there are no migrations to make. I just have to run the existing pre-built migrations with migrate. So why are you doing that if you haven't made any models? Because I want to show you um, some of the built-in um, functionality in Django first before I show you anything that I'm going to build. Okay. So let's go to PSQL.
Um, all right, so in the settings, uh, where is it? So, so the very next thing that I want to do actually is create a model for our users. You know, we're going to be signing up and logging people in. We need to have a model for our database for our users. Um, but Django actually comes with one built in, which I just want to show you very briefly. Um, in the installed apps, one of them is called Auth. It manages Django authentication. So if we look in our database, we've got uh, auth underscore user. So there's a user model as part of the auth app. Uh, if we, let's just describe it. So this is the default built-in user model. So if we want, without defining any of our own users, or without defining our own user model, we can create users just with the default model. They'll have this information, ID, password, username, first, last, email, and then some Boolean flags, you know, are they staff, are they active, are they super user, when they join, stuff like that. So it's nice that Django provides this to us by default, but unfortunately, the default fields in this user model are very generic, and they probably don't meet all of our application's needs. So, you know, there's no address field or phone number or anything. It's just exactly what you see here and nothing else. So what we're going to want to do is extend the built-in user model in order to uh, accommodate custom attributes for our application. And there are a few different ways to do that. So the first option is to actually not modify the user model at all, and then just create an entirely separate model that uh, relates to it. So for an example, I'll just show you real quick what that might look like. So we import the user model, but not from any file that I wrote. It's from the built-in Django models. And then I'll make my own class. Um, so employee is gonna be like a type of user, and then maybe they have a department Uh, but more importantly, is they have a user field. So here we've got two models completely separate from each other the user model built into Django and our custom employee model. And we create a one-to-one -one relationship between them. So the idea then is the user model is basically just going to store their username and password and is used for authentication, logging in, logging out. Um, and then this other model like employee is going to contain the custom data for our application. So this is called using a profile model. Uh, 
All right, so another option, uh, if we don't like this kind of setup, is uh, create a subclass Make a subclass of the abstract base user class. So this is built into Django, and we can make a subclass of this in order to make our own custom user class. But the problem with this is that this is the base user class. It has basically no functionality um, by default, except that it'll hash passwords for you automatically, which is very useful. But there's a lot of other useful stuff that I would also like Django to do for us. So there is a third option, which is my preferred option. Is we're going to make a subclass So uh, in my opinion, this option gives you a good balance between convenience and flexibility. So that's what I'm going to be showing you how to do today. Although if you read through the Django docs, they'll actually describe all three of these methods in detail. So you can you know, solve the same problem in a different way if you like. So let's, let's go define a model now. So in our blog app, models. So we'll import the abstract user class. And I'll create my custom app user class, not user, because that's already defined. That's built in. I'm going to call it app user. Uh, and it's going to inherit from abstract user, not from models.model. So this is a more specific type of subclassing here. Um, and now I'm going to specify the unique distinguishing fields for my app user. All right, so there's their email. Um, and that's actually the only field I'm gonna define here. For everything else, I'm happy to use just the default built-in uh, fields on the abstract user model. So I don't need to specify those if they're defaults. So like password, I don't have to mention the password here because that's just handled automatically. Uh, what I do need to specify though, this is going to look a little weird. Uh, the username field is email. What is with my syntax highlighting here?
there we go. So I was saying before that um, in modern web applications, we typically sign up or log in using your email and password, whereas Django has kind of a more like old fashioned assumption that you're going to log in with your username and password. And so like throughout Django's authentication system, there's this idea of the username field, which is just whatever you use to log in with, which is not necessarily the username field. So try not to get confused, but in our situation, because we're going to log in using the email, their email address, the email field in the database is the username field as far as Django is concerned because the email is what we're going to use to identify our users when they log in. So what does that make the username field then? I mean, nothing very important. It's like a nickname, basically, display name. OK. Also, what is the verbose name? Um, I don't remember exactly. There's some situations where you'll want to like see a human readable description of a field, I believe. And so the verbose name is supposed to be more human readable. Okay. Or we can just remove it for this and demo. And that abstract user, does it have all the fields that you're showing us down here on the public.auth user? I don't know. Why don't, we, why don't we create one and then we can see it in the database. We can see what they've got. Great idea. Yeah, let's do that. Um, there are a couple other things I'll have to build before we can get there, but that is the next major thing I want to show you all. So Raphael, does line 12, does that make the user name show up as email or, or does it just replace username with email? Um, it doesn't like change anything in the database. It just means when we try to log in with this user, are we logging in with their email or with their username? Like which of these fields is supposed to identify this person? Okay, so then what we have here, basically in the in the database username will never even be used. Okay. Um, I mean, I might manually assign a username when I register a user, but I don't need to. Okay. Um, whereas in contrast, I do need to give them an email address. So by default, I think the email is uh, optional and not unique, but the way I'm setting up my database, I need the email to be required and unique because I'm using that to identify users. Um, and one other field I got to include here, required fields is empty array. This is basically saying that, actually, let me finish this line here. Um, so this is saying that there are no required fields to create this user, except for like the obvious required fields that are apparently so obvious, I don't even need to say them here. So it's assumed that you know the primary key is required, like the username is required. So I don't need to say that email goes in here. Um, and then also password is always required for registration. So I don't need to specify that either. So apparently required fields empty array is what this is supposed to look like in this situation. Uh, I think it's a little bit unusual, but that's what Django is expecting. Um, okay, so one other thing I got to set in my settings.py, uh, I don't think we've done this yet. But I have to tell Django uh, what model I'm using for the users. Because normally you don't have to specify this because Django assumes that the user model, the built in user model, is used for managing users. But since I'm using my own custom user model, I have to declare in my settings.py um, 
that we're actually managing our users with blog app .app user. All right, so next, let's make some pages. I want to create some users, so I'm going to create a sign up page. So we're going to have to set up the URLs first here. Um, what's the syntax for this? I don't know why it's not included in the boilerplate because this is definitely like the first thing I have to do with every Django project I make. It is interesting that you have to import include in path. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm going to have to create URLs.py in my blog app, which like it's part of the best practices for Django. It's like, you're supposed to do that for all your apps, for all your projects. So I don't know why they don't just give me that file for free, given that they've already given me like dozens of other files here, but whatever, uh, that's a little too meta for this conversation. Let's continue here. Um, so where's this gonna be? Path at sign up or no. So path at empty string is gonna include blog app URLs. Here we will create URLs.py. Import my views. So let's make that view now. So I just want to make sure my server is set up correctly. We're just going to print hello. Hey, Raf. What's up? Uh, so, sorry, I might have missed it. Uh, did you start an, is this a whole new Django template? This isn't building off of your other blog app. I don't see any of your other stuff, right? Right, this is not building off of yesterday's okay. project. I did Hang reuse on. the virtual environment just out of laziness, okay. but all the code is fresh. In a different database, I assume? Yes. Using Django auth, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, so let's try to run this guy. Dependency on app with no migrations. Uh, so let's try to make migrations and run them. Uh, I make migrations. and migrate uh, excuse me
Hmm. What's the name of your database, Rafael? Uh, BlogDB. I'm wondering if it's just weird because like I changed the auth user model after doing the initial migration. I don't know. I'm just going to drop the database and try this again. Yeah. I was also going to say we could double check if the right database name is in settings.py. Um, pretty sure I set that. Yeah. Blog oh, yeah. DB. Totally. Database name. That's what yeah. That. that was my next thought, just dropping like and, and deleting the migrations and dropping the DB. Um, Is it worth dropping the migrations and making sure that we have what we expect in there? Um, hmm. I think if I just make migrations, it'll overwrite it. But I guess I'm honestly not sure. Let's try it. Um, yeah, I think make migrations. If migrations already exist, it won't yeah, redo something these. that's been done. I was actually wondering about that with another student, if we have to worry about anything in the PyCache directory when we're getting rid of migrations. Um, or I may have gotten... I don't know, I've never I, worried about the PyCache. I don't think it's an issue. Well, yeah, I may have gotten confused actually about that. Thank you. So it's kind of, we're creating our user model. Um, did it create migrations? It did not. I'm not sure why. Do we need the app name in the make migrations command on the command line? Shouldn't be necessary. Do we need to add an, another model? Because it looks like it's well, well, something in the it. I could have sworn you could just make migrations without the app name and it would just do them for all your apps. But it seems like it was waiting for me to tell it which app to make migrations for. And Maya, you're correct. If we hadn't deleted the migrations, we would have needed to add something for a new migration to be created. And it... So real quick, under migrations, I didn't see it. What exactly did you delete? Because I keep running into migration errors. And I'm not sure if I delete the entire folder, if I just degrade the delete the zero zero one thing i just deleted the whole folder and then recreated them all uh in theory that shouldn't be necessary there should have been so when you I do make migrations out, but... it will make that full like the actual folder not just the file name right it'll create the folder if it doesn't exist and then fill it with all the migrations that you should need okay i'll try that if i run into that same error um, but yeah, generally speaking you should not be deleting your migrations uh, especially after the project has already been published, it's online and like you're sharing with other people, you definitely don't want to be like handling your database like that. Um, but since like, I basically haven't even gotten the started yet, it's fine. All right, so uh, sorry, on that point, I ran into the same issue where I had to delete my migrations because if I didn't, it kept giving me like a default value error, but the problem was I didn't have any data in my database. So I didn't understand 
why it would have wanted a default value when there was nothing to default. I mean, yeah, if you like change your model so that a field becomes required, but you already have data in your database that is missing that field, then like you can't run the migration because that would put you in an invalid state. You would need to like also edit all of your existing data so that it's consistent with the new schema you're trying to create. No. All right, so I'm going to go to the sign up page. Cool. So we got it. Look in my Python console, it says hello. Amazing. So this is uh, hooked up, it looks like. So before we can just let people sign up, we have to give them a sign up page. So we'll say if quest.method equals get. So we're going to send them uh, this template. So I'll have to make that. And then inside of templates, So let's see, for our signup page, we're going to use Axios again. So I'm going to grab that real quick. Just paste that guy right in there. We're going to also need our own script. Uh, but now this is referring to our static folder, and I haven't set that up yet, so I'm going to have to do that next. I think you misspelled script on line four. It gave me a matching invalid close tag. How nice. Okay, cool. Thank you. So we'll create System our is key. <laughs> create our static folder. Inside of there, we're gonna have a JS folder. Inside of there, we'll have our main.js. We just make sure that this is working at all, put a quick console log in there. Need to declare my static directory in the settings file. Nice. Cool. So we got that hello. So it looks like the script is hooked up now. So next thing I want to do is use Axios to send a sign up request to our application. 
Uh, I'm going to do this in kind of the lazy way that we did before, where I'm not going to actually use a form, just uh, Axios is going to post data just when the page loads. Uh, where did I just put that? Uh, did I put a dash in here? Let me double check that. I did not put a dash in there. Okay, that would have definitely confused me. Um, yeah, that's a good catch. This is like my probably top five recurring bugs for me is just inconsistently putting dashes in sign up and login. So since we said that they're logging in with their email, wouldn't it have to be an email or no? Um, it should be email. That would be more sensible. But we're going to get opportunities to rename this data um, before it actually gets into our database. So I just thought you had set up a, a setting that said we're forcing the username to be an email or something. Yes. I'm just saying that like the data gets relabeled many times, like before it actually gets into the database after the user types things out here. So like the, I could call these keys whatever I want and that doesn't really have any technical bearing on how my Django backend works. But it would be more sensible to call this email if that's what it's supposed to be on the back end. We're just going to log the response here. Nothing too fancy. All right, so now we're getting a forbidden error. So that's from the CSERF, I believe. Yeah, CSERF verification failed. So again, we're not handling that this week. So we're gonna just disable CSERF for now. Is there any way to write the CSERF exempt inside of a JavaScript function, or is that just not something you do? That's not something you do, because um, it's not something JavaScript knows about or is responsible for. All of those uh, security settings relating to CSERF are being enforced by Django. So, like, even if you were trying to submit like a post request, like you would still like, what if you weren't trying to use a view? Is there no way you could? Like get around that, I guess. I don't know if that makes sense. It makes sense to me though. It's gotta happen in the server side code. Um, because it's the when the server is handling HTTP requests where it's determining the rules for like cross C surf stuff and sending it back to the browser. So by definition, any JavaScript code is running in the browser. So we have to do it in Django. Um, I, Raphael, I don't know. I suppose there might be some way to do something in a view with the code that's getting like executed on the server side, but it wouldn't it wouldn't make it wouldn't make sense. It's really the route handling function in Django where we need to handle that. Yeah. 
yeah, this needs to happen in the views. All right, so, so on a get request to sign up, we just show them the sign up form. But then that sign up form lets them send post requests to sign up. And then if we receive a post request at this URL, we handle it in this block of code, in which case we, uh, so, you know, signing up, logging in, this is always uh, a very error prone process. So it's very important to use exception handling. So I'm going to do some try accept here. I've got import JSON. So this is this is going to be pretty amazing. So you remember yesterday we spent all that time like hashing passwords and generating salt and like concatenating strings and whatnot. So this is how we do this with the Django authentication. Um, oh, I got to import this guy first. So I'm importing my app user model, but I'm aliasing it. So I can just refer to it as user. So just keep in mind though, that this isn't actually the built-in default user. I'm just using this name user for my user model with an alias. Um, Is create user a method of your user object? It is. So this is a special method that belongs to the user model in Django. It doesn't just create a regular object in the database but it's going to do all of the you know password hashing and authentication special stuff um, that I was doing manually before Django does that automatically here so I'm passing in password equals body password but that's not actually what's going to be saved in the database All right, let's see if we can actually register somebody. Looks like no. So we got this oops message. What is going on? Missing one required positional argument. Um, hmm. So I guess the username is still a required field, even though I'm saying that the username or that the email is what we're going to use to log in. So whatever, we're going to assign them a username as well. Don't you need a return statement as well? Yes. Yes, I do.
All right, so there we are returning data in all cases. Even if we throw an error, we're still gonna tell the user that you failed to log in. Um, it's really important, especially with authentication, that you give a response to the user in all cases and let them know what went wrong so that you know people aren't permanently locked out of your site, unable to sign up or register. So yeah, let's try this out. So I refresh the page. Okay, we get data success true. Okay, that looks promising. So we haven't gotten any errors. So I am assuming that we have successfully created a user. So let's look at our user. Does um, the Django built-in uh, user model and everything prevent us from creating two users with the same username? I'm not sure. Yeah, I was just curious. We can always find out. I want to say it's not unique, but I don't know that for sure. I should look, actually. Let me look. OK, so all right, so now if you look at the tables, um, so previously there was a table called auth user. That was just the default user model from the auth app. So now that no longer exists because based on my models and based on what I said in settings.py, what my auth user model is, um, I'm not actually using the default user model. So I guess when I've set this up correctly before running the initial migrations, um, Django doesn't even create that auth user table. Instead, we have blog app app user. So let's see what's in there. So this is my blog app app user. Uh, looks pretty similar to the default user table, uh, except the email is not null. So I think that's the most notable difference. Uh, let's look at our data though. Select star from, let's try that again. Okay, so here is our user. Uh, Jeff Bezos at amazon.com. Didn't give him a first name or last name. Um, username is just the same as the email. But Django is doing some things for us automatically. Set so tells us he's not staff. He is app active. He's not a super user. Um, we created his record at this point in time. And he has never logged in. Uh, also, most importantly, I want to point out the password field here. Um, so you notice there are actually four sections here separated by dollar signs. So here you've got the you know PBK F12 SHA-256 and then a dollar sign. And then you've got this 3200 and then a dollar sign. It's cool that they tell us the algorithm, the hashing algorithm that they use in that first part. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is the salt in the third part. And then this is the actual hash in the last part here. So yeah, like Adam was saying, this first part, this is the hashing algorithm that's used. So like the hash itself has information about how to how it was created, how to hash it. So like even without reading the code, without reading the docs for Django, without knowing what hashing algorithm they use, I can just look at this actual hash and it'll tell me like, oh, using this algorithm with this salt, where is it? Yeah, this salt 
that's how you hash this thing. Um, so it's not really like a secret what the salt is. It just creates extra work. Uh, so let's see. Django actually has a really nice description of this. Where is it? Here we go. All right, is this it? No. Here we go. Okay. How Django stores passwords. I really love this just very simple explanation of it. Um, so this is what your password is in the database. It's first the algorithm. So we saw that was uh, SHA-256. And then there's the iterations, which is like, how many times is your password being rehashed? So I've heard of this in other contexts called the work factor. But I think what the idea is just that like, what I was telling you before about how modern computers are too fast and it's like too easy to guess someone's password because you know you can hash a billion passwords in like an hour or whatever. So that's a lot of guesses that you can make really fast. So the solution is just like, you know, if hashing a password is 10 times faster than it should be, just hash the password 10 times then, and then it takes an appropriate amount of time. So the iterations is saying like to generate this hash, how many times did we rerun the algorithm on that input? Like hashing it over and over and over again. Um, so it says here the work factor is 320,000. I'm not sure if that actually means that it was hashed 320,000 times or if there's some other way to interpret that number. But generally speaking, a larger number means that you're just doing extra unnecessary work to hash the password for the purpose of making it take longer so that they are harder to crack. Um, then after the second dollar sign is the salt, which like I was saying before, you use that to rehash the password when the user logs in again. And then lastly is the hash. Um, so it's not absolutely essential that you know this, but I think it's really cool being able to read a hash and know that like it is a hash. It is what it's supposed to be. I agree. I also think that's cool. And I threw that link you were showing, Raphael, in the resources tab for folks. Oh, cool. Thank you. Uh, so one other bit I want to point out about this little table here is just the is active field. So by default, I don't know if this is actually used for anything. I think I might have to flip it myself. Actually, I'm just going to Google it. Uh, Okay, so Django doesn't necessarily respect the is active flag, but it can be configured to automatically um, check it. So basically what that does is if a user is set to is active false, they just can't log in. Um, and I think it should also prevent them from showing up in queries. Yeah, because they don't have an cool. is deleted flag, it's just is active. Um, so this might be a little bit different from other ORMs I've used. So I haven't tested this behavior specifically, but generally speaking, like one of the nice features, the benefits of having an is active flag like this is that instead of deleting the user, you just set them to inactive, but then you should still be able to pretend like they were deleted when you're writing the rest of your code. So like the ORM, if you tell me select all the users, a smart, sophisticated ORM is not actually going to select all users, like you asked. It's going to select all active users or all the non-deleted users, because it assumes that that's what you meant. Um, so we still get to query our database in a simple way, as if these users were really deleted. But it lets us actually keep our data in case like a user wants to um, you know, undelete their account. So we can give them back their data and all their friends, their connections, whatever, because it was never actually deleted. 
Um, so I'm pretty sure like all modern websites do this, like especially Facebook, you know, there's no way you can delete your account and they can always uh, recreate, restart your account, even if you disable it. Um, modern web applications just basically don't ever delete data. Alicia? And are those actual like F and T values or is this just showing us the shorthand for false and true? I believe it's shorthand. Um, so like we wouldn't say is active T, it would be like is active true. Right, you would set it to true or false and then Django ORM is doing some kind of translation here. Okay. And then when you get a chance, can you show your, I wanted to see your model again. You you made the email distinct, right? Because Adam asked if it was, um, deep, if it defaults like that, but I think you made it like that with your user, right? The I unique. said it to you, Nick. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. since we're setting our username equal to that email, we're essentially making the username distinct true, right? Say it again. Nothing. I'm pretty sure I know the answer. Um, I'm not actually sure if, like, effectively you're correct, but I'm not sure that we have anywhere like enforcing if you manually created a new user that the user name field has to be unique with the code that there currently is. I'm I'm not a hundred percent on that, but I does that sound right, Raphael? I'm not sure either. I guess we can test this. I did. In I did look in the way. Django docs and when you shared the SQL, it didn't look like there was any built in like unique stuff happening. So could you just delete the username field from your app user since you only want to use email? Um, probably. I'm not sure offhand how to do that, honestly. Uh, adding extra fields is really easy, but I'd have to Google for a minute to find how to remove default fields. I'm sure it's possible. I feel like someone's asked me this before, but I don't remember how to do it. I would be very trepidatious about doing that. Just if Django adds that as a default, who knows where else it's expecting it to be there in, in Django's own code that interacts with, with like users. Yeah, that's a good point. If it's part of the framework, there might be other pieces of Django that are expecting users have usernames. So yeah. I would probably just leave it there if I don't think it's hurting anything. I would be very, yeah, it, that's a good thought, Alicia. But with like a framework like this, I would be very trepidatious about doing something like that. Um, oh, wait, I didn't test this correctly. Um, username. So now I'm actually sending a username. Um, yeah, it looks like the username is unique. Oh, that's cool. Hmm. That's interesting. I wonder where, oh, they must have just done it. They must be enforcing it with an index. So uh, I remember when you showed that SQL, I was looking at it and, but, but yeah, that, cause that's how they normally enforce it at the SQL level. So I, I was looking in the wrong spot. That yeah, is not, cool. not you mentioned, I really should have just described the table to begin with. This is a much more straightforward way of answering that question. Um, I didn't think about it either. So yeah, here's that unique constraint. The username must be unique. Um, what are we doing here? And was email already a default field on there and you just edited it or it wasn't a, a field on there at all? It did exist, but I needed it to be unique. Okay. So I added that one field wherever it is. Uh, Michael? 
Uh, I don't know if I'm missing something, but so on your table, what, where it's describing it, it says that all the fields except for, it looks like last login have to be not null. But then when we created our entry, we don't have like a first name or anything. Does it set it, does Django RM set it to null or what does it set it to? I'm guessing empty string. Oh yeah, that probably makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question though. That's 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 a good that's a good kind of thing to to notice. That actually um, is a really good point because not know like I thought it would require you to put that information in there. I mean, null is just one specific value. It's null. I can set it to anything else that's not null, like empty string or zero. I guess I just thought if you didn't put anything, it would, I thought the default was no entry equals null, but I guess, I guess not. Um, so that's actually one of the like slightly frustrating things about Django ORM is just the relationship between null and empty string. Um, so there are a lot of times where like you create a new object and you don't specify all the fields and Django will say like, whoa, these fields can't be null. So I'm going to assume that you meant empty string instead of null, and then it just puts empty string in for all the fields you didn't specify. I don't know if that behavior is what I would want, but that's how it works here. And I'm pretty sure that's what we're seeing in this case. Yeah, I, and I, I agree it is a little confusing that it does that. I could see it's just a question of trade-offs. I, I can kind of see why they did that because they don't want to force people to always have to enter in a first name and last name. I don't know why they said not null. Maybe there's some like low level reason in terms of how Django ORM works where, where nulls are, are problematic. Not sure. Uh, but anyway, at this point, I we've talked a bit about sign up. Next thing I want to do is talk about logging in, but I think it's a good time for a break maybe. Uh, if there aren't any more urgent questions, let's uh, let's take a break right now. It's eleven ten. Come back at eleven twenty, and I'm going to show you how to log in our users. Hello, class. Welcome back. So when we left off, we had just uh, registered a user. Got a Jeff Bezos Amazon.com been able to sign up. So next thing we need to do is let them log in. So I'm going to create a new path for that. Uh, so similarly to sign up, if we get a get request, we're going to just send them the login form. Otherwise, we will, um, on a post request, we will process a login request. So let's just get this page working real quick. Um, and actually, it's going to be pretty similar to the sign up page. So we're going to just copy this. Use a different JavaScript file. It's going to be a login JS. Now I'll make that script file.
Now let me just make sure this is working correctly. Cool. So my login page is hooked up. Uh, so the login request is going to be pretty similar to the sign up request. And of course, that gives us an error because we have not uh, coded up that route on our back end. Um, are we actually, what was the issue? Oh, yeah. So since we're sending a post request to log in, it did handle this, it did handle the request but we didn't return anything because it was not a get request. So it returned nothing, which is an error. So we need to make it actually return something. So also I wanted to go back on the last one you did return JSON response success false success true because you said uh, we want to make sure that we tell our user whether it was a success or not, but you never mm -hmm. actually did anything with those values and those wouldn't have actually showed up anywhere that the user could see because you didn't like make an alert or set a value equal to anything, right? Yeah, in a more fully featured demo, um, we should do something intelligent in the dot then and then maybe also have a dot catch. Um, so that way, if the user fails to sign up or log in, you can give them a message that tells them what went wrong so they can try again next time. The doc That's... catch specifically catches the error, is that? Right. So dot then is like if the server responds and says like, sorry, you couldn't sign up because you know your password isn't long enough. Like that's the server successfully sending a response. So that would go in the dot then. But like if your server is just down, that would probably throw an error. And so you'd have to handle that in the dot catch. Okay. So a couple of different ways that you know your code cannot work the way you want it to. But in all of those cases, you need to tell the user what went wrong and what they should do instead. Okay. So if you were gonna pull the email and password from your SQL. That's obviously a whole different story here. I guess that would be through a, I don't know, how would you do that? What's your question? Uh, I mean, you wrote your login JavaScript with a, you hard coded in a username and password. Uh, yeah. I mean, in a more complete example, if I had more time to build this, uh, there would be a form on the login page. You type in your email and password, yeah. press Thank submit, you. grabs it from the inputs. Got it. Yeah, I was just uh, blanking for some yeah. reason. Wouldn't be such a useful website if everyone just logged in as the same user. But just for the demo, we're doing that. Can you scroll up to the top of your views? I'm just trying to see what all you're importing. All right. Just some basic stuff. All right, so we're trying to log in. So if they send a post request, so this is a login attempt, not asking for the login page. First, we can check the body. Grab the email from there. Grab the password. And then we authenticate them. Uh, 
Um, where does authenticate come from? Triple. Yeah, that's correct. So from jam contrib auth, we get the authenticate function. All right, so uh, first thing I want to point out is that in the authenticate method, the fields I have to pass in, the, the parameter names are username and password. That's just how authenticate works. But I know in my application, they're actually using their email address to identify themselves. But this is that part where I was saying that Django still calls that the username field. So in this context, when I'm using authenticate, it wants to know, like when it says username here, this doesn't mean like actually what is the user's username in the database. Like uh, here, this is not what it's asking for. It's asking specifically, what is the field that you use to log this user in? Which we specified in our models that that was gonna be email. So here, when we authenticate, the username field has to be their email. Um, and then what this does is it returns a user object from the database who matches these credentials, or it just returns uh, none if there is no user with these credentials. So it doesn't actually log them in, it just tells them if they're valid. And so we could have done email equals email as well, right? Uh, here? Yeah. No, you could not. It's expecting parameters, email, and password. Or I'm sorry, uh, username and password. Okay. Um, so let's see. Then once we've... Mm -hmm. Sorry, did someone have a question? Right, I'll wait until you finish this part. Okay, so... Uh, once we have checked if they are a valid user or if their credentials match anyone in our database. So assuming this returns some user from the database, user is not none. We're going to check if they're active first. Don't want to be logging in inactive users. Then we're going to try to log them in. Um, where do I get login from? I'm guessing also from contrib auth. So the login method takes the request object and the user from the database, and this is what actually starts a session. Um, so actually, before I run this, I want to see what's going on in my network tab currently. OK, so there's no cookies being used at all yet. I've registered a user, but that doesn't start a session for them. So Django has not set any cookies uh, on my machine that I can see so far. OK, so that's what I'd expect.
What is the is active checking again? Um, I'm sorry, what is what checking? User dot is active. Just. How does that differ from not none? Um, so the is active is just a field in the database. So we might find a user from the database, but they're oh, set to inactive. So that would be like if someone deletes their account, um, we don't actually remove their record from the database. You just set their account to inactive. But if they told us they deleted their account, then we should not allow people to log in as them. OK. Um, OK, so yeah, if they can't log in because their account is disabled, we give them that message. And then the client would be responsible for displaying this to the user somehow. Um, or wait, um, so, so this one is login failed because this is just we got an error in the login method. I'm not sure why that might fail, but if it does, we're just going to say login failed. And then here in the else, reason is account disabled. And then if there's no user at all, uh, tell them the user does not exist. So let's see if we can log in now. So I'm going to load the login page, and it's going to immediately fire off a post request to log in for Jeff Bezos at Amazon.com with the password of dragons. And we're going to see if that actually logs us in or if we get an error. All right, so it's all 200 responses here. Uh, post a login, got a 200 response. So that's cool. So I'm going to inspect this. I'm still thinking about cookies here. Hmm. Totally thought it should be sending some cookies for me. Whatever. We'll move on from now. I was curious. The login method that you call inside our, our view function on line 40, um, I just missed where we import that. Django uh, control off. Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK. Yeah, I got confused with the function definition. It does it. I'm actually a little surprised that it lets us have two functions with the same name. Oh, you know what? Hmm. Hmm. That does seem like a problem, doesn't it? I was wondering, but I, I wasn't sure if I had missed. Something. So let's rename this to something else. Um, this is going to be the login view. This is my login view. Uh, let's see if this does anything different. I'm going to be surprised if it does something different too, because I would have expected some weird recursive something.
Do you need to change it to in uh, your Axios post? Pardon? No, uh, we didn't change the login view. We didn't change the name of the route. Yeah, it's still the same URL. It's just the oh, function gotcha. name is different. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, the URL is fine. It's more within that. Yeah, it's a good question, though. Okay, there we go. That's what I was expecting to see. Um, so yeah, I think what was actually happening uh, before was that I was importing this method login, but also I made a mistake in that I had defined this view handler, which is another function called login. So when I was calling login request.user, I wasn't actually calling the Django auth login method. I was just calling my view handler again, which was not throwing an error oddly enough. I don't know why that would fail silently, but it was certainly not doing what I wanted it to. Yeah, I'm surprised that failed silently too. I wonder if <laughs> I wonder if it ended up in a different like if clause the second time it got called, because I, I would have expected an error or some kind of like endless loop where it, the function keeps calling itself recursively. Yeah, not sure. Uh, but anyways, I think we're past that now. I'm glad because that could have been pretty nasty to debug otherwise. Um, Yeah, so I was saying, what was I saying? So looking over here in the network tab, um, this is the first request just for loading this page. And so when I loaded this page initially, didn't have any cookies. Um, but then this request down here on the bottom, this was the actual post request to log in uh, request method post status 200. And so here on the response headers, um, we're getting our session ID is set. So we saw that the other day just using Django sessions, but it's the same cookie when we log in, it starts the session ID for us, or it starts a session for us with a session ID. Um, and they also give us a CSERF token. which you'll note is not HTTP only. So the session ID is HTTP only. CSERF token is available in JavaScript. Get out here. So yeah, there's no session ID because that would be a security vulnerability, but we can, can see the CSERF token in JavaScript because as we'll learn in the near future, uh, not this week, <clears throat> but in the future, we'll learn how to handle this token with JavaScript to satisfy um, Django's security requirements. Michael, got a question? Yeah, so when I when I put document.cookie on my console, I guess I also get a user ID. Like it's, it says user ID, then it has like a number, and then it has a CSERF token after that. Is that like normal? Um, I mean, it depends. It sounds like you've got other cookies that were left over from something previously. Are you in incognito mode? Oh, that's probably it. That's probably it. Because yeah, um, cookies are just based on domain. But since in local development, all my projects are on localhost 8000. So it's very easy for my browser to get confused and send the cookies from my previous project to my next project. So that's why when we're dealing with this, this authentication stuff, it's very useful to do our developing in incognito windows. Um, okay, so let's, let's make a home page. I feel like we should have one of those. And yeah, it's going to yell at me because I don't have that yet. So I'm going to make it. Give me 
make an index HTML. Uh, I said we're going to make an index HTML. And then in here, I want to see some information about the user. Now I could just look up the user in the database based on like their session ID or whatever, but Django is going to do me some favors here. It helps me out with this a lot. Um, wait, this is the page I want. Okay, so now that I'm logged in, <clears throat> um, I have access on the request object. There's request.user, which just tells me which user from the database is currently sending this request. So this is just phenomenally useful that Django gives you this for free. Excuse me. You don't have to like grab their session ID and then look them up from the database and like match things against each other or whatever. Just if someone is logged in, you can access their information at um, request.user. So let's go to index.html. Then we're gonna pass in the user. So I'm not sure if I can do this. Ah, uh, has to be a dictionary. So I could convert this uh, user to a dictionary, or I'll just create a dictionary like this. Cool. So now I just loaded the home page. But because I logged in previously and it had set these cookies, what? now when I send requests, I'm sending it back up. So I'm sending my session ID. So Django knows I um, that I have an active session and it's able to use that active session to connect me to a user in the database. I'll talk to you after I get a break. I love you. I, I want to hear it, but I, I really need to pay attention. I'm Mike Maya. I love him too. Bye. Um, <laughs> no worries. That's just remote life. Um, so Django knows uh, when I send this request because of the cookies, which user from the database is associated with this request and get access to that and request that user. And so just the same way we've been sending data into uh, our templates, I can add information about the user to our template so that they, you know, we can display their information on the page. Michael, question? Yeah, so when you are passing the data over, you have the dictionary like email request.user.email. If we wanted to access more info from that user, could you, could you just do like user request.user? And then how would you access like the email uh, and other information? I'd have to convert it to a dictionary. Um, Oh, well, maybe there's a more Django -y way to do this. Is it that easy? 
the model to dict method something. Um, I'm not sure if that worked out how I wanted it to. So there's a method. Um, it might be from that same Stack Overflow post. I pulled it up. Uh, if you import from Django.forms, ooh, .models, uh, there's a method called model to dict. So Django forms models. Mm -hmm. And model underscore two underscore, uh, yep. And I, I'm not 100% because I'm seeing this is coming from something form related, but we can, we can try it out. Someone, it, I mean, it sounds like it does what I want, but the previous thing sounded like it did what I wanted to. So we'll find out. Amazing. OK, it looks like it works better than what I did before. I don't know what the difference is, but thank you. Yep, it was the same Stack Overflow post too. I think it's just, I, I, sometimes it's like the comment says, oh, I tried this and then that doesn't work. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, so that's uh, one option because for whatever reason, you cannot pass objects into templates. You can only pass dictionaries in. So sometimes we have to convert our objects into dictionaries. Um, there's a couple hands up. Who's got questions? Uh, yeah, so you converted it into a dictionary, <clears throat> but then in your index.html, you only call the key email. So once you convert it into a dictionary, does it look for the email and then produce that email? Is that how it's working? Um, oh. I mean, so maybe I'm not sure if I understand you, but this model instance is an object which has like fields on it like objects do, and it converts those like OOP fields into like key value pairs for a dictionary. So it should okay. be like the same data, just different data structure. So is that why in your index HTML, when you called the key email, it actually showed the entire email because it's calling it from within that dictionary? Uh, yeah, email would be okay. one of the keys on the dictionary. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Justin? Uh, yeah, my question is regarding database kind of management. Um, so we, we've, we've, uh, we're storing users in our, in our database. And if, if our app, you know, like for the car app, if we had a bunch of cars and brands and stuff in our database, uh, would you generally kind of wrap everything in, inside one database or would you segregate uh, your user database from your actual detailed information database. Would we ever connect two databases to the same app and kind of differentiate, or are we going to be kind of putting everything into one database? Uh, generally speaking, I would encourage you to put everything into one database for one project. You know, okay. Is that just for, uh, you know, ease of, of project making for practice, or is that not a normal kind of behavior? Um, I think it's definitely normal and definitely easy. OK. Um, you do see situations with like microservices where an application is split up into many smaller servers that may have their own database individually. But that's kind of a different issue, I guess. Okay. So like, if there's some physical reason why your application should live on multiple servers, and it might also make sense that each of those servers has their own database. But if you've just got one application server, like don't split your data up into multiple databases for organizational purposes. It's not going to make your life easier. OK. I mean, um, we've, been, we've been playing with the luxury of being able to kind of drop our database and re, recreate it and migrate mm -hmm. it. Um, 
if you have uh, you know uh, users already logged uh, logged on your database, and you kind of make you make a mess of your your data for for your actual app, and you want to you know you, your make migrations isn't quite working right, you'd have to drop it and recreate it. You would lose all that extra data beyond. You know what I mean? Uh, so I guess that's just something to deal with. I mean, in theory, you back up your data. So okay. that way, if you make a mistake, you can at least go back like not too far in time. Uh, is that something Django does for us or something we'd have to do on our, on our own? How would um, I don't think Django does it automatically. Yeah. That's kind of outside the concern of okay. what Django. I don't, want, yeah. I don't want to rabbit hole this, but just the thought. Yeah, uh, some kind of snapshotting like would happen like daily or maybe even hourly depending on you know how big the i guess i'm is. guessing it's not really relevant or important to us uh, at this point so not not exactly um, okay that's fine if, then we can move on i'll just tell you real quick have you ever heard of cron sure. no uh so cron uh named after the greek god chronos of time is a linux job scheduler this is a pretty old program but it's definitely like still very useful today i've used it for a variety of purposes basically cron lets you set a schedule in terms of like how many times per day or per week or when or whatever and then choose a script and then that script runs at that set schedule okay. so it's yeah. commonly used for There's database backup. backups you just say like you know every night at two in the morning we're going to dump the database into a file and then upload the file to amazon s3 where it's going to be safe and secure and then in case like everything burns down um and our app crashes data is ruined we can you know recover our data from the last night's backup or whatever okay <laughs> sounds good cool good tidbit to know thanks Let's see, where was I here? Uh, so yeah, I was just showing you how awesome it is that you can access the user. Um, but let's say we don't want to actually be logged in here all day. At some point, we need to log out. So I'm going to make a button. Just since we have five minutes to noon, I'm going to do an inline script tag here. <clears throat> Just save us a minute. Actually, no, we're not using a button here. Um, well, we are using a button, but we're also using an anchor. Oh yeah, I got thrown by that the other day. So it doesn't even need an ID, not even gonna use any JavaScript. So we're just sending a regular old get request to slash logout. Then I'll build that route. Uh, well, actually, let's put the URL in first. We might run into the same uh, method name issue. God, uh, yeah, yeah, we yeah. will. Yeah. Um, 
which I guess is good to see because everyone's gonna <laughs> who uses Django is gonna run into it. Uh, so this one's real simple. So just like there's a log in method, there's a log out method, uh, which is much simpler. You just give it a request object and it ends the session for that user, basically. And then I'm going to redirect. to actually just the home page again. So they send a get request to this logout route, and that's going to send them right back to home, except when they go back to the home page, they'll no longer be logged in. So, so here we are at the home page. It's welcoming me. If I log out, uh, what is the problem? Log out, did not match. because it is log out. So let's try that again. So I click the log out button and uh, I need to do some error checking, I think. Uh, views pi line 10. Oh, just for my print statement. So yeah, I'm like assuming that the email, I'm assuming that the user exists, but this line of code is going to throw an error if there is no uh, user logged in. So we've logged in, we're at the home page, log out. And what what is going on? I think that could be the model to dict. Yeah, let's end. just check if the user exists first. That's probably a smart thing to do. Um, Yeah, this does raise it. This is a common issue that comes up too. And then it's like, do we create a, a logged in user page? This kind of questions of how do we want to separate um, and manage our code? Um, yeah, I thought what you said made sense, Raphael, about just like an if clause to check if, if a user exists. Um, or just creating like another like view function would be the up. Okay, so so the they do still have a user, but they're an anonymous user, which I have to check for correctly. How are we doing this? Oh. Yeah, and like I wonder how much, like does an anonymous user have an email field? Well, so I was thinking you were re redirecting them back to your homepage, which I think is where you're printing off the email, but 
since they're not logged in, you can't access that, which is why I think you're getting that error. But I was right. Thinking, I need normally, to just check like, before I render it. Um, well, wouldn't you normally like uh, redirect to like a logout page that just says like you've successfully logged out instead of sending them back to the home page? Would you? I don't know. I feel like. I logged on to my bank account just to check if that's what normally happens, and that's what happened oh, there. I don't well, know. sure, your bank account would do that because for your bank, it's very important that it's like clear to the user if they're logged in or logged out. But I think a lot of other applications, when you log out, they'll just take you to the login page. Oh, okay. So you have to have a bunch of if statements in your template? Uh, that's one way to do things. Yeah, and that's a good call, Alicia. Like when I'm working and I have to kind of make those kinds of like UI decisions that that are more technical and that like a lot of designers, unless they have a lot of user experience, experience aren't as familiar with all the time, I'll be looking at like, what do other sites do? What do existing businesses similar to whatever this project is for do? Um, yeah, for sure. And then it's interesting because just like Raphael was saying, we see with banks, like they got to do it. But with like Amazon, you know, if you log out, I'm pretty sure they'll just redirect you to their, their home page. Do you have to import something for is authenticated? Uh, no, it's just a property on the user. Should be. Okay, there we go. That's what I was trying to show you. So nice. we go log in, I'm logged in, great. Go home, tells me I'm Jeff Bezos and Amazon. I log out, redirects me to the login page, no longer have the user data, so it doesn't interpolate anything in there. Um, and uh, honestly, I could probably use a smarter template. Like if email is undefined, it just shouldn't look like this. Um, so I could use an if statement in here, just be like, if email, something like that. I'm not exactly sure what the syntax is exactly, but the idea is that there are different ways that you can handle you know, the conditional logic here. Either render a different template or have your template prepared to render different elements based on what data is present. A lot of different ways you can do it. Francisco, um, did you have a question about something? I did. Um, so my question was, a, I thought index was specifically for after we logged in. So if we're redirecting, what's the purpose of redirecting back to index and not login? Because wouldn't redirecting back to login avoid that entire error? Um, I guess that would make a little more sense. So we'll go back to login page. I guess that's a more typical application flow. That's a good point, yeah. Um, and honestly, after logging in, it should redirect me back to the some other page, like a dashboard. But we don't actually have a login form. So yeah, here, I'm logged in, I logged out. And it takes me back to the login page, which should have a form on it. But whatever, this isn't a complete application. Yeah. And it's good to see this stuff because now that we've got like logging in and stuff, we have different like states that the user can be in that we have to start thinking about more when, when we build our applications. So it's um, kind of a cool, cool thing to see. So one last thing I want to leave you with. This is just something I find very useful. When I'm building applications that use authentication, I always define a route called who am I? And all that does is uh, send the user, say, if the user is authenticated,
And then you probably want to send some other data too, but not necessarily all of their data. Uh, something like that. So now my front end from any page on my site, if it needs to know who is logged in, I can just send an Ajax request to slash who am I and get some JSON back describing the user. So this is nice because Django and JavaScript are not connected inherently. Your front end code doesn't automatically know who is logged in. And we can pass some some data into our templates, but that's not a two-way connection. And very soon we're gonna stop using templates entirely uh, because React is gonna be our whole front end. So especially when we're using React and our components need to know who's logged in, I really like just building this who am I route so I can just send a quick request as soon as the page loads and then figure out who the active user is. Um, do we have any questions about any of this stuff so far? Can you go back to the index? Pardon? Uh, your index view. Scroll up, please. Um, originally, we were pulling uh, request.user email, and you mentioned that uh, Django had the give that to us for free, and uh, even before they were authenticated. Uh, the request.user uh, so we're getting, yeah. Request that user. Okay. And then you, so in this case, you uh, changed how uh, the email is showing up. It was only whether or not they're authenticated. And that comes from the data that is already a part of the database. Okay. Okay. I just answered my own question. Cool. Thanks, Raf. Welcome. Happy to help. Uh, yep. Alicia, what's on your mind? Yeah, I had two questions. Um, the first one is on that uh, that thing that you just showed us. Notice you're returning JSON response, but I don't think I saw any sort of JavaScript tied to that, or did I just completely miss that? Who am I? Uh, where are you looking? The re on that that who am I thing? Uh -oh. You're returning a JSON response. Yeah. So yeah. I haven't written any front end code that uses this. This is just a capability that my server has now. Uh, I could, you know, write a request on my index HTML or whatever that asks for it. So um so well so there is there a reason that you're not just like I guess making a separate URL for that and returning a render of the user or because it's intended for Ajax. I don't want to send HTML back and just like have a page that describes the user. The point is that other pages on the site might need information about the user that they like use for logic or some calculations or whatever. Okay. Oh, so like you would write a function so that you could just click on a button and say, okay, this is my user and go from there? Um. Like, I think a good example would be like, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Raphael. Uh, no, go Later for it. On. Yeah. Um, well, I think the big thing, actually, because I, I had to pause thinking about this too, and we haven't gotten here yet, but soon we're not going to really be using Django templates much at all. Um, we're going to be using React. And so, for example, for a user profile page, we won't have like a Django template file that has HTML for what our user profile is. We'll have like some JavaScript code that builds some HTML that builds the user profile page. But now that needs to talk to our server to get that data. And we'll use Axios to do that. And that's where like that who am I um, requests could be really useful. Um, I don't know if that was the best example. 
actually. I'm not sure if that was the best answer to your question, Alicia. I apologize. Okay. Yeah, I was just trying to get a feel for like how you would actually use that. Because I thought I thought initially you were just saying if I ever wanted to check, then I would just go to this URL that I'm just making myself so that I know. Um, but it sounds like you're wanting it to be accessible for every page on your document. So I'm wondering, is that going to be connected to a button or like? You wouldn't have it, it connected to a button, probably. I would just do it like as soon as the page loads. So like here, this isn't connected to any user interaction. It's just as soon as the page loads, we're sending a request to who am I? And then JavaScript gets access to the data. And then we can um, you know, update the DOM with the data we got from the server or do something behind the scenes with it. Um, like, I don't know, maybe we got a list of your friends or something and we want to, mm, that doesn't quite make sense. Oh. No, can that's that's a good. Can you go back to the the uh, views page again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're just sending back the email. Yeah. Okay. And we might send back more information if the client needed more information. If there was more information about the user. Okay, and then uh, the last question I had was: when you log out, can you show us what that does with the cookie? Um, so let's see, right now, when I loaded this page initially, I sent my session ID cookie to the server. Now I will log out. And so then it redirects me. And then when I go here, still have the CSERF token but I'm no longer uh, sending the session ID. So since for this request, my client, my browser is no longer sending the session ID, Django has no way to associate this request with a user in the database. So that effectively ends my session and logs me out. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. Django, I wonder if Django like, deletes information about the session cookie or updates it as logged out or something in its database too. I'm, I'm not actually certain. Yeah, I'm not sure what the mechanism for that is under the hood. Might be interesting. Um, do we have any other questions? I see there's a lot of activity in the chat. Just real quick for that, who am I script? Is that is that where you would not want to use defer because you would want the page to wait for the JavaScript to load that? Um, or is that when you would just use an inline script, I guess? Probably defer it. So yeah, I would definitely not use like an actual inline script like this. I would add another script tag here and then defer it so that they can see as much of the layout as possible before JavaScript loads. Although in a lot of cases, it might not actually make a difference because like realistically, if what we're trying to show the user is like information about the user, like their email address and you know their friends list or whatever, we're not going to be able to render any meaningful content unless we until we get a response back from here. So it might not actually matter too much in some situations if you defer it or not. Good to think about though. Uh, any other questions? Questions, questions. All right, well, I have a question for you folks about authentication. So maybe you've seen this before. You try logging into a website and you fail. Your credentials aren't correct, but you're not really sure what you messed up because the website just gives you a generic error message. Uh, username or password was incorrect. Now that's like pretty frustrating because you, know, you only typed in two things. It's one or the other, but they don't tell you which one is wrong. 
Uh, does anyone know why websites do that? For what cyber security. Yeah. So can you explain a little more? They don't want to tell you if that was a, use, a proper username because you can limit the number of like attempts for a password and then lock out a, a user. Mm -hmm. But if you try to iterate through a bunch of users, then you're not going to get like a lockout. Mm -hmm. So it's a way that to prevent a uh, bot or a automated way to try to enumerate users um so for one thing i don't think bots are going to be like logging in automatically through the actual front end of the website because like if you need to actually click in through a login form like you're not going to be able to make a billion attempts in an hour you're limited to you know a few every second based on how quickly the http traffic can go over the internet um so i think it's more focused on like people just trying to manually guess other people's passwords, but it's, it's still the same general concept that um, they don't want to give you too much information about like the account that you're potentially trying to hack into. So they think that like, if they tell you, you know, wrong password, then you know that the username was correct. And that kind of like narrows down your search space. Um, so in my opinion though, this is not actually a good practice and the people who recommend it just like to sound smart but don't actually think this through um so for one thing this is wildly frustrating to your users if you don't tell them why they failed to log in um because like you know sometimes people reuse the same password on multiple websites or they have different email addresses for different websites um it can really help people remember their credentials if you tell them if it was the email address or the password that was wrong. But moreover, this doesn't even improve your security because if a hacker wants to know if a given email address exists in your database, they're not gonna try to log in with it, they're gonna try to register it. So like in this example, um, you know, where was it? If I'm trying to hack into Jeff Bezos's account, but I don't even know what his email address is, and I think it might be uh, Jeff Bezos at Amazon.com, instead of trying to log in um, and guess his password, you know, because it'll just tell me like username or password is incorrect. If I just try to register that account, it'll tell me plainly you cannot register that account because that email address has already been taken. So that tells me like everything I was trying to know. So long story short, these like super vague error messages that companies give for authentication does actually nothing to stop a savvy hacker from breaking into your account and is just super frustrating to your users. And I guess it lets the developers pretend like they're really smart. So that's my soapbox. Just please don't like cargo cult like security practices, just like do things because other people say they're good without understanding it. This is why I want you to understand the security practices that we do. So yeah, that was my spiel. Uh, any any last minute comments on that? So that works if it's a open registration website. Yes. Uh, yeah, which I guess is not all websites. That's true. So there are many websites where you just have to contact sales in order to create an account and you can't just sign up freely. So in that case, it would actually, um, you know, provide more security to give a vague error message. But like, I definitely see a lot of instances in the wild of just like regular free SaaS applications that give you super crappy vague error messages on login and very clear error messages on sign up. So it's like, very clear that they're not taking a big picture view of security of their application. They're just like implementing features one at a time because they heard it's a good security feature or something. Right. Like, so trying to log into the admin panel would be very helpful to not tell them they got the username wrong for the admin. And that wouldn't be a place where you'd have a register for an admin. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That makes a lot of sense there.
I just want you all to be thoughtful and understand what you're doing. I do like the perspective though. I've never heard that before on the, uh, the fact that you could just enumerate through registration instead. So, mm -hmm. yep. Registration forms, if they have public registration, will always tell you um, if you're trying to register an email address that already exists, which is something people forget about a lot. All right, so on that note, uh, we've gone over a little bit, sorry. So I'm gonna, if there are no more questions, I think we're gonna conclude the lecture here. I have, I have one, one That's question right. kind of. Uh, one last question. <laughs> so it, it occurred to me that, uh, you know, we go over so much material and content in this uh, course and you guys show us kind of uh, large code chunks like logging in and such. When I'm doing my assignments and I'm practicing, um, a good chunk of what I write is me looking at something I've already written or something that has kind of been provided. Um, and I realized that I, if I had to sit with just a blank Django and implement something like this, I, I wouldn't necessarily be able to do it off the cuff or from memory. So how much of that is um, important when we walk away from this course, how important is it that we can sit down with a blank template and be able to accomplish all of this from scratch or is it totally okay to be able to look at things whenever you know what i mean because it would change the way i'm kind of practicing and learning i would be more hard on myself and maybe not look at things uh i don't I mean, necessarily copy and paste but i think you should be able to do it from scratch but by from scratch i mean looking frequently at the django docs and stack overflow okay like not necessarily relying on your prior work because at some point you'll have to develop apps in new frameworks that you haven't used previously. But like for me, certainly when I was developing this demo in the first place, like before I was uh, experienced with Django, I was definitely just like looking at the docs every five minutes, uh, just constantly running the code, throwing errors, trying to see what worked and what didn't. Um, you know, like I think I spent an hour or two just fiddling with this field here, this required fields, and trying to see like what actually happens if I say email is a required field and like why does that throw an error? That's weird. Okay. Um, just like all these little notes that I add about, you know, this is kind of weird, but that's just how Django works and we'll have to accept it. Like those little notes that it takes me like five or 10 seconds to explain to you was probably like an hour of my time that I spent scratching my head, and just right. like reading the docs and throwing errors. Yeah, I, well, I mean, like this last assessment was pretty much build a website in a weekend. Um, mm -hmm. And if I, if I tried to do that from scratch without actually referencing things that I had already accomplished uh, in other assignments, then there's no way I would have finished that in two days. I would have spent an hour fixing one thing yeah, uh, you know what I mean? So in the context of the course and the pace of the course, it's almost inevitable that I have to look back at things I've already done and just reincorporate them. My two cents is reinventing them. I, I don't think anyone does things from scratch the way that you are talking about in, in this ever since the internet, basically. Like even when I'm like the term greenfield is like building a new project, like, you know, not working on an existing code base, like building a new site from scratch. I will look at docs. I will look at like, I will search for like good sample projects on GitHub or tutorials. Um, it's because a lot of the times there are like good resources on like good patterns or architectures to use. Um, or if I'm learning a new technology, I want to see what the best practices are. Um, and, and to echo what, Raphael said there's definitely like a level of of comfort and especially for interviews to be honest like being comfortable with the programming language and like knowing how to do like fundamental things like for loops and string concatenation without looking at docs is, is critical but I, I feel like um, my rule of thumb is like I want to understand what the code I write does. Like, I don't want to write a line of code and not understand what that line does. 
Right. I don't have to go a, a zillion levels down to understand like at the very deepest level, but I need to know the basics. So yeah. And like, that's what, like half of what you do as a software engineer, half your day is just Googling and researching and, and looking at other code. Um, I think the real danger is borrowing code from other sources and not understanding it. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at like this whole uh, kind of uh, sign up login and part of me thinks I can create a Django app that accomplishes this and then incorporate that in other projects that require login features and just modify the database name and such as needed, right? I mean, I don't know about this specific sign up work. login flow, but like when I'm working on an existing code base all the time, I'll copy code from one part of the code base and modify it. Like that's right. a very common technique. So I think you're in good company there. Um, does that make sense to you, Raphael? It doesn't make sense. Um, I do think, you know, copying what I've shown you here is going to be a good start for you, but authentication in general and Django auth in particular can be a little bit complex, a little tricky. So I suspect that you'll find some surprises. You'll have to do a little bit of tinkering in order to feel like you're really comfortable with the Django authentication. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And honestly, especially for learning, I recommend looking at other code, but typing out your own code. Yeah. That's what I've been doing is I'll, I'll I'll look at a code chunk, but I won't just grab copy and paste the whole chunk. I'll, I'll rewrite it out. Um, yeah, that's awesome, that man. Summary. Yeah, I think okay. you're doing yeah, it the right thanks. way. Yeah, if someone puts you in a room with no internet and says, and no docs and says, build me a site using Django, that's, that's not gonna, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> All right, any last, last questions for real this time? Going once, going twice. All right, thank you everybody for listening and being engaged in my extended lecture. That concludes today's uh, lecture content.